I'm Jennifer Goodman. I'm the executive director of the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance, uh, the statewide historic preservation organization, membership-based organization. My colleague, Nicole Flynn is helping me out. And um, I know there's several members of our great board on board in this call too. So great to have them here. Maybe they should wave, wave board members. You can't see everybody at once. Um, I think a lot of you know us, we're the statewide nonprofit. We help about a hundred community projects every year, uh, as well as lots of um, homeowners, uh, owners of historic uh, homes and barns. We're in the business of helping save and reuse old mills, meeting houses, main street buildings, and much more. Um, at another level, we also work to kind of build the toolbox. So there's, um, we're removing obstacles and we're accelerating preservation investment with grant monies, new incentives, um, and obviously good old fashioned education and outreach. Um, uh, we have a small staff team that lives and works all over the state. Um, I, because we're talking about a Concord property, I thought I'd mention I've been a Concord resident for over 20 years. Um, and certainly this, this building, the gas holder building has always been of, of interest and concern to me. Um, so we're glad to have you here for this program called What's So Special About Concord's Gas Holder Building? Should it be saved? <laughs> um, the Preservation Alliance really counts on support from people like you. Really appreciate those of you who are supporting our as members, annual fund donors, about um, almost 80% of our operating dollars comes from people like you. So um, thank you for supporting your, our work if you already are and please consider a investment in our activities if you aren't yet. Uh, a lot of you know our seven to save program. Uh, we just announced our new 2020 list last week. And some of you might've heard or read that uh, for the first time in the program's 14 year history uh, the board relisted something. We relisted the gas holder building um, because of its national significance that we'll be talking about tonight and because of the imminence of the threat, the, the imminent, our concern about um, its loss in the near future. And in terms of that thread, you might have read or heard that um, the owner, Liberty Utilities, has expressed interest in securing a demolition permit by the end of the year, which is obviously very soon, only a couple months away. Um, to kind of round out where we are to, to re in response to that news, um, Concord's Mayor Jim Boulay, who I think is on this in this Zoom session, um, appointed an ad hoc committee to identify um, possible redevelopment op options for the gas holder property that would be compatible with uh, the community's vision for the neighborhood, the community and city's vision for that southern corridor of the city, and have really win-win positive effects in terms of preservation and economic opportunities. Um, Councilor Byron Champlin is the chair of that ad hoc committee that the mayor created in response to this new news from Liberty Utilities. And um, he's joined by four additional city councilors. I just wanted to name them. Councilors Todd, um, Kredovic, Kennison, and Werner, and Tim Sink from the Concord Chamber, um, and several folks involved in real estate preservation and redevelopment. Um, Bill Norton, Frank LeMay, Ben Wilson, John Chorlian, and Liz Hangen also joined those counselors on that steering ad hoc committee. Um, the Preservation Alliance is supporting that effort and we're managing a, um, a sort of a very focused consultancy that's trying to help sort of build good information um, to support that committee effort. Um, so the Preservation Alliance um, um, uh -oh. offered, everybody good? good. Offered to offered. help. We're, one way the Preservation Alliance is helping is with this outreach effort. So tonight's forum is one of those pieces. Um, and there's a second session, I think a lot of you know on November 5th, and we we're trying to um, be thoughtful and um, communicate well, but also move on a pretty quick timeline um, to meet Liberty's schedule. And um, uh, I wanna give a shout out to the Concord Heritage Commission who's represented on the ad hoc gas holder committee and who's cared about this property for a long time and most recently underwrote the nomination process to place this property, the gas holder property on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, the, 
and I just wanted to make the point too. I don't. I know Liberty Utilities might have a representative on this call, the Huck Montgomery, who sits on the committee. I forgot to mention his name before, but he's on the committee. Uh, Byron Champlin, the chair of the committee, I think is also with us this evening. Um, Huck has a new baby at home, so I don't expect him to be on this Zoom call. If he is, maybe we can see the new baby, but probably not. I hope he's home, focused on home and baby. Um, but they're very much at the table and part of this conversation. Um, so shifting back to today's session, which is why you're here, but I wanted to give you that, that kind of context and background. Today's session is really about focusing on the history and significance of this building, um, kind of why it's important almost from an academic standpoint, but we also wanna talk about why it's important to the people of Concord and it's important to people kind of beyond Concord too. Um, we're not going to introduce everybody on the call, of course, <laughs> but I wanted to provide a little bit of context about who's here, um, who's here with us this evening. Um, we've got folks outside of the Capitol, um, Moultonboro, Intervale, Westmoreland, uh, Wilmot, um, but I, from a quick scan of the list, I would estimate that um, more than three quarters of you live in Concord or have a tight connection to Concord through work. Um, there's definitely some long-term neighbors of the gas holder building who um, RSVP'd to attend this session tonight, as well as great representatives from the Concord Historical Society, arts and business organizations, um, as well as the kind of architectural design and building world, and the media. I think we've got some folks from uh, the Concord Monitor with us this evening. Um, I guess I wanted to make the point that I feel like that committee that I referred to before feels like a dream team in terms of um, skills, interests, and energy. Um, and this kind of feels like a bigger scale dream team to me tonight. Um, you folks who are really engaged in civic life and um, I would guess, I know some of you and I don't know others of you really kind of understand the challenges and opportunities associated with a unique place like this. Um, and I'll tell you more about that second session later and I'll make sure when we do a follow-up email, you get information. I know some of you have already signed up for the second of these two sessions that's really focused on the redevelopment um, potential for the site. Um, that's on November 5th, also at the same time from 5.30 to 6.30. Um, so I'm gonna introduce the four panelists first and then we'll make sure we have some time for um, questions for the panel, other comments about the place's history and significance. Um, because there's so many of you and we're not unfortunately in a room all together, um, I would really encourage you to use the chat function and we'll try to keep track of the questions and say the questions as folks answer it or um, call on you um, if you have a specific question kind of depending on how the second half of the session goes. Does that seem okay? Good enough? <laughs> So about our panelists, um, I'm really grateful for these four um, stepping up to prep and present uh, what they know and their perspectives on this gas holder building and the property. They're doing it as volunteers sort of outside of their day jobs and um, in short order. <laughs> I'll give very um, brief introductions of all four. Uh, I would say that the brevity of my introductions is inversely proportional to the depth and breadth of their experience and skills. These are folks who have done amazing things, um, some of them in Concord in terms of uh, preservation work and certainly um, across the state and some outside of New Hampshire as well. So I'm gonna go through the four in the order that they're gonna be um, offering short presentations. Um, we're fortunate to have Ben, ben Wilson, Benjamin Wilson, Wilson with us this evening. Um, he's our State Historic Preservation Officer, which is also the head of the Division of Historical Resources. His agency is kind of the public sector brother to the organization I'm with, the Preservation Alliance on the nonprofit side. Um, ben previously managed historic sites for state parks here in New Hampshire and worked in Savannah and Charleston. Is that right, Ben? One of those. <laughs> Before coming home to Concord, um, and these jobs at state parks and now at the Division of Historical Resources. That office, I just would mention, manages federal programs uh, involved with review and compliance, as well as National Register, um, historic preservation tax credits, and other programs. He's going to offer sort of an overview of significance. 
Um, following Ben will be uh, Liz Durfee Hengen, um, known about town and Concord, certainly a longtime Concord resident, former chair of our organization, and also the Heritage Commission in Concord, involved in many successful preservation efforts over the years from saving the Ralph Barn in Penacook to innovative uh, watershed-wide preservation work around Squam. She's gonna connect us to the industrial history of Concord in her brief remarks. And to round out the panel, um, we're also fortunate to have retired state architectural historian, James Garvin, who's retired from the state office, but continues his practice, helping uh, many people and many projects around the state, um, helping understand, document, and preserve historic properties. And Roger Reed, um, coming to us from DC. He's the historian for the National Register of Historic Places at the National Park Service. Um, before uh, being at the Park Service, he, was the, he worked in the State Historic Preservation Office in Maine and on the city level in Brookline, Mass. So um, again, thank you to those four for being with us today. And thank you to the audience for uh, participating in this. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Ben. Great, great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It's wonderful to see so many faces, so many um, faces that I know. Um, what I'd like to do is I'm going to give a brief hif history of the company that um, is responsible for the gas holder site and what is uh, remaining there. Um, and I'll end with a few uh, sort of fun facts about, about the building. Um, Jennifer is going to scroll, scroll through a few pictures, um, none that's necessarily attached exactly to what I'm uh, discussing. Also, I want to make note that um, what I'm going to be talking about can be found in the National Register nomination, which our uh, division, uh, DHR, will put up on our website. So if people want to uh, read the full nomination, which is really interesting, um, they'll be able to do so. So with that, uh, the Concord Gas Light Company was chartered in 1850 to provide street lighting for the downtown area of Concord. On the verge of becoming a city, Concord recorded a population of 8,576 in 1850, a sufficient density to justify the investment of a gas lighting system. The company held its first meeting in, eight, in August of 1852 and purchased land from the Concord Railroad Company on the south side of Concord at the periphery of downtown between South Main Street and the railroad tracks that were laid out in 1842. It hired the Summersworth Machine Company to construct the gas works facilities on the site. A few small commercial buildings, including two blacksmith shops, a shoe shop, and Abbott's carriage works were scattered nearby. The area's proximity to the railroad was essential to the Concord Gas Light Company's manufacturing process, providing efficient access to the railroad cars that transported coal to the complex where it was heated with oil steam and uh, to produce gas. By 1857, 21 locations in downtown uh, and in the downtown business and residential areas north of the Concord Gas Light Company had gas street lamps. Demand for gas to supply the city's lighting and heating needs increased rapidly in the 1860s and 1870s due to the growth of Concord. In June of 1870, the Concord Gaslight Company manufactured 9,161,000 cubic feet of gas in 18 retorts or ovens using 1,200 tons of coal. Its capitalization grew from an initial value of $35,000 in 1852 to 80,000 by 1870 and 100,000 by 1880. Its four gas holders had a total storage capacity of 80,000 cubic feet. Two adjacent to the gas house each held 16,000 cubic feet. Another on the property of St. Paul's School at the end of the distribution line held 8,000 cubic feet and a fourth on the edge of the business district held 40,000 cubic feet. By 1881, Concord had 133 gas street lights and demand continued to outpace production. By the late 1880s, the company's average daily output was 95,000 cubic feet and its highest was 112,000 cubic feet 
which meant that during high demand, the facilities could not store enough gas, and on days of heavy usage, the system almost ran out of gas. Recognizing the need to expand, the Gaslight Company acquired the lot adjacent to the northern boundary of the Gasworks complex in the summer of 1887 and began construction of a new and larger gas holder, the gas holder that we see today. Dealey and Fowler of, of Laurel Ironworks, a gasworks manufactory in Philadelphia, designed the gas holder tank and its brick enclosure. John M. Hill, treasurer of the Gaslight Company from 1856 to 1888, made some alterations to the Dealey and Fowler plans to suit the company's needs. In general, however, the new structure was typical of enclosed gas holders built around the same time in the Northeast. The Italianate detailing of the brick gas holder house reflected <clears throat> the aesthetic that the Gaslight Company wanted to convey as a prominent business within the community. The below ground tank could hold 800,000 gallons of water and the wrought iron single lift gas holder had a capacity of 120,000 cubic feet. The purified gas retort or oven entered the holder the south valve house and exited through the west valve house into the city's distribution mains. And those valve houses are the small little gabled bump outs that you see. One has, uh, has collapsed um, since uh, in the last few years. The cupola provided ventilation for any gas leakage. The New York construction firm of W.C. White built the gas holder house and Laurel Ironworks assembled the gas holder. Local contractors E.B. Hutchinson supplied some carpentry work, while W.M. Dara installed the slate roof shingles and Samuel Holt produced the 550,000 bricks used to construct the enclosure. Two granite retaining walls were also constructed on the site to retain the terrace slope around the gas holder house foundation. Final inspection of the completed gas holder house occurred in December of 1888. At about the same time as the Gaslight Company expanded its gas works, it also attempted to capture the market for electric lighting in Concord. The company altered its charter in 1887 to enable it to furnish light and power by electricity, and in 1889 negotiated a purchase of the recently organized Concord Electric Light Company and its electric generating plant. In 1892, however, Concord Gas uh, like sold the electricity plant to the Concord Land and Water Power Company, which then contracted with the city to supply its electric lights. The same year, Concord Gas Light leased its gas works to the United Gas Improvement Company, a large holding company headquartered in Philadelphia. This company took over maintenance and operation of the Concord facility, renamed Concord Light and Power Company and almost immediately converted its gas production from the traditional coal burning process to carbureted water gas. The conversion involved the construction of several new buildings and structures on the site, but the gas holder remained in use as a storage tank for the purified gas. Continued growth of the city during the early 20th century increased the number of gas customers who primarily used the fuel for cooking and space and water heating as electric lighting superseded gas. In 1921, the Concord Light and Power Company built a new steel telescoping gas holder immediately south of the gas holder house that had a capacity of 500,000 cubic feet. The gas holder house became a relief holder for the raw gas coming directly from the gas house before it was sent to the purifier house and then pumped into the new gas holder for distribution into the gas mains. It remained in use and unaltered for the next 30 years. During the late 1940s and early 1950s, demand for gas increased and technological improvements in the manufacturing process um, enabled the company's production to exceed the design capacity of its generator. Between 1951 and 1952, the Concord facility produced a record 1,359,000 cubic feet during a 24 hour period. Its distribution also totaled 45 miles. 
The introduction of a natural gas pipeline to Concord in 1952 prompted another overhaul of the company's facilities. The business changed its name to the Concord Natural Gas Corporation and began converting its distribution system to natural gas on August 13, 1952. Its production of gas and amount of stored gas decreased over the next year as each section of the city switched over to natural gas. By August 13, 1953, the last day gas was produced on the site, all the holders were empty. The gas holder house has remained unused since that day. Energy North acquired the Concord Natural Gas Corporation in 1985 and dismantled the 1921 steel gas holder in 1989. The two earlier brick gas holders on the site were removed by 1932. The other buildings and structures in the gas works complex, the regulator houses, boiler house, retort or oven house, purifying house and oil tanks were removed in the 1980s. Liberty Utilities acquired the gas holder property in 2012. And with that, I'd like to just give a few um, details about the building itself. Uh, the gas holder that we see today is 88 feet in diameter. It's 72 feet tall to the top of the cupola. It has a 24 foot below grade for the tank. Uh, the Historic American Engineering record recorded the building in 1982. And I know Jim Garvin will talk a little bit more about that uh, in detail in a little bit. The exterior is 16 bays of brick divided by uh, pilaster, brick pilasters. 14 bays have windows and there are two valve houses. Walls are over one foot thick. It's laid in a running bond, the brick is, that is, and bluestone trim for windows, sills, um, buttress caps, and the water table uh, are also employed as materials. So with that, I'll turn it back to Jennifer. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ben, great overview. So next to Liz, Liz, gonna, uh, Liz Hangen's gonna give us a little industrial context for uh, the history and overview that Ben just offered. Liz has some slides too, I know. Yes, thank you. So Concord's gas holder was an integral part of a lengthy industrial corridor that for more than 125 years was Concord's economic engine. This corridor stretched from Horseshoe Pond up in the north, all the way along the railroad tracks, paralleling the river, past the railroad station in the heart of downtown and on south to the south end rail repair yards for the railroads. This is a distance of two and a half miles. You can only see the northern half in this photo. Most of the city's industries were strung along this transportation corridor, served first by the river, and then starting in 1842 by the railroad, and then 100 years after that by the interstate. It was a busy and noisy and at times smelly industrial spine and it employed thousands of workers. I'm gonna give you a sampling of the diverse industries that populated this corridor in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And for some reason, sorry, what happened? Oh. I'm gonna close it and start I'm again. Let's try it again. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, I need a quick lesson in how to advance it because it's not advancing on. It looks my... like your your little where the six is on your the arrow. Let's see if that works. The what? <laughs> on your keyboard, the six. That's what I would use to advance it. Yeah, it's not working. You could hmm. escape and um, once you hit escape, and you can go to that other format. Stop share? No, just hit escape on your... Um... Yeah, it's like everything is suddenly frozen. Sorry about that. 
Lower left arrow, says Kate Marquis. <laughs> yeah, none of the arrows is working. It's as if my keyboard is defunct all of a sudden. Why don't you stop sharing and I'll try to pull it up. <laughs> all right, sorry. It happens with every Zoom call, it feels like. <laughs> um. <coughs> Well, what I was going, to, what I was continuing to say was that virtually all of these industries were dependent upon the manufactured coal gas that came from the uh, the gas company for illumination, heat, and power. Um, second slide. <laughs> Page belting at the north end of this corridor was a major producer of leather belts that were used to power shafts and pulleys in factories all over the country. And in the uh, Rumford Press was the largest printing press in all of the Eastern United States. Here, many of the nation's most widely circulated magazines were printed, including Reader's Digest, Atlantic Monthly and House Beautiful and you might be interested to know that since these magazines were shipped out of Concord, over the course of a year, our post office generated more in second class postal receipts than all of the post offices in the states of Vermont, Rhode Island, and Connecticut combined. And this is one of the few industrial buildings along this corridor that is still standing. <laughs> There were a number of iron foundries along the corridor. Ford Foundry in the bottom produced stoves and sinks and plows, while Clapp Foundry made castings for the railroad, building materials, manhole covers, and even a nationally pop, uh, patented and very popular drinking fountain that served people and horses and dogs, simul not simultaneously, or through the same pipes, but whose system of pipes kept the water moving in a circular motion so it wouldn't freeze. <laughs> Farther south, Prescott, Oregon was in a building complex on South Main Street where the Love Building is now standing. And it housed numerous industries over the years. There was a firm that made pianos and organs. There was a carriage making shop, a company that made woodworking machines. There's one on exhibit in the lobby of the Love Building. And in more recent years, a book bindery. One of those machines is also on display. And the photo shows Sally Paveglio at the sewing machine in the bindery. Abbott Downing, a world renowned maker of stagecoaches and probably Concord's most famous industry. It occupied an entire block just north of the gas holder. It was in business more than 110 years and it exported its prized coaches all around the world. The lower left photo shows the extent of the complex and the circle building, which you can see in the lower right, is one of only two buildings still standing. Uh, fairly recently, it was a dry cleaners and it's right on South Main Street. Holt Brothers. This building is immediately adjacent to the gas holder, just south of it. The, uh, the one on the left is a piece of what you see on the right now where Sunel Auto Parts is. Four brothers from Loudoun moved their manufacturing business to this site back in the 1860s, uh, conveniently located near Abbott Downing and it supplied wagon spokes and hubs to it. The brothers soon expanded into farm implements and in fact one of the brothers held 95 patents including those for the harvester and the Caterpillar tractor. The railroad, of course, was a major factor in the location of these industries. Access to it allowed these factories to import needed raw materials and ship finished good to distant markets. The station was about midway in the corridor, shown here in the lower right, and it was designed to reflect the city's importance as a transportation, commercial, and political hub. In fact, it was exactly 60 years ago that the station was torn down. There will be an interpretive panel erected in the next month or two to acknowledge the station's presence. 
Such a demise is what we hope will not happen to the gas holder. The repair shops at the far south of the uh, industrial corridor also stood just south of the gas holder house, an enormous complex that employed some 1300 workers and served half of the entire Boston and Maine system. Here, uh, cars were uh, repaired and locomotives were built in that large building in the lower right. All of these industries would not have existed without the gas that came from the gas holder company and the city could never have grown and prospered the way it did without this gas. That's the last slide, correct, Liz? Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It was wonderful to see that industrial context. Um, thanks, thanks. So then we just have two brief sort of perspectives from um, James Garvin and then Roger Reed. Jim, would you like to take over? Uh, sure, thank you. It's great to be here. Great to see so many friends listed on the screen. Um, I, my function, since you've had this wonderful double introduction to the technology of the building and the complex itself, and then of the, of the industry that it powered, is to tell a little bit about the national scope of interest in this building. Because I think that we in Concord and we in New Hampshire tend to assume that this is something that we treasure and we appreciate. We see every day if we're lucky enough. But what we may not realize is that the nation as a whole is, uh, well, those people of the nation as a whole who are interested in industrial history are very much focused on this building. This is an important monument, has become more and more recognized as such. We Americans, um, we did not have too much interest in our own industrial history until the mid 20th century. We were a forward looking people and we still are, and we tended to think of old industry is something that that was interesting perhaps, but obsolete and replaced by our wonderful new technology. Every generation has thought that even since the 1850s when this complex was built. But in the 1960s, we began to get lessons from England. Uh, the English have long had a very deep interest in knowing about and preserving their industrial heritage. And they invented the discipline called industrial archaeology, which was a, a term that seemed to be a contradiction in, 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 in its English when we began to hear about it in this country. We think of archaeology as digging in the ground, but in fact, industrial archaeology largely deals with above ground artifacts like the ones that we've just been talking about. And those whole complexes of, of structures like the ones that Liz showed us are great monuments of industrial archeology, span although sad to say, most of the ones that Liz showed us are gone now. The railroad station, the railroad yards, and many of these others are available only in, in a vestige of what they once were. But in 1971, there was a conference, an important conference held at the Smithsonian in Washington. And at that conference, a number of, well, first of all, a, a, some experts from England came over and told us that we have a great industrial heritage, which we're not celebrating as much as they, as, as they do in England as, and as much as we should. And so at that time in 1971, an American organization called the Society for Industrial Archaeology was founded at the Smithsonian. And, and the, the Society for Industrial Archaeology remains vigorous and stronger than ever and deeply interested in resources like the gas holder. Um, in 1978, the National Park Service published a book called Gaslighting in America and drew attention to the fact that until the mid 19th century, when gas began to be a, a commonplace utility in the larger cities of the United States, you had no method of lighting after dark except with oil lamps. When you stop to think of it, the introduction of gas piped through underground pipes and delivered to houses and factories and so forth it, it, it re revolutionized the way in which we live at night. It revolutionized industry because our factories, our mills, all, most of which had their own gas holders in those days, um, could operate after dark, whereas previously they could not. So this was as revolutionary as the later introduction in the late 1800s of electricity. But we tend to think today of gas as something that you cook with, but you know we don't realize the monumental importance that it had in transforming the United States. 
Well, that was um, in, in, uh, in 1978 that that book was published. And in 1980, we in New Hampshire actually founded the Northern New England chapter of the Society for Industrial Archaeology. And in fact, a couple of the slides that we saw during Ben's talk, including a, a colored slide of a bunch of people walking up toward the gas holder in a very reverential way, um, and another slide, a black and white slide that showed a bunch of ladders up on the building and people crawling all over it and doing something. These were important. This, the, the 1980 slide, which was the colored one, showed the founding of the Northern New England chapter of the Society of Industrial Archaeology. Um, I was there. In fact, I took that picture. And this was a remarkable uh, transformation in New England, Northern New England, in that it drew attention to um, the creation of an organization that celebrated this type of thing. In 1982, which is represented by that slide that showed ladders up on the building, the Northern New England chapter created a, an initiative to measure up that building and to document all of its, its mechanisms and, and its technologies for the first time. And this was done through, um, largely through the, the hospitality of Cedric Dustin Jr., who was an employee of the Concord Gas Company and deeply devoted to the preservation of that building. So in 1982, a, a stellar team was, was brought together, including a number of people from Concord, a number of people from New Hampshire, but also including people like Eric Deloney, who was the founder of the Historic American Engineering Record in Washington, um, and, and, and several others from the Smithsonian who came up to Concord to participate in this project. And at that time, the set of drawings which, and the set of photographs, which you saw in sample form um, during Ben's talk was created. And I wanted um, to say that Gary Sampson was the photographer for those wonderful historic American engineering record photographs. And Gary is with us tonight, which he may want to say something about his memories of those days. But in any case, um, uh, that was an important, uh, a very important uh, documentation that we we're leaning on still as we do the, the National Register nominations and the other recordation of this building. Um, in 1984, Bill Taylor, the late Bill Taylor, who was a professor at, at Plymouth State University, did an article in IA now, IA is the uh, is the journal of the S Society for Industrial Archaeology, the, the the publication that that organization puts out and still puts out to this day, and and Bill actually wrote an article, the Concord, New Hampshire gas holder, the last intact survivor of the gas making era, and what he meant by that and is that we already knew back in the 1980s that there was no other gas holder house in the United States that still retained its internal tank and its valves and its other mechanisms that made it an operable thing. Um, in fact, just to get leap ahead a little bit to a couple of statistics, there are only 14 gas holder, holder houses left in the United States. And there were once hundreds, if not thousands, because this was an, an essential industry, but now there are only 14 left. And one of them, by the way, is the logo of the of the Society for Industrial Archaeology. That's a, they use a, a drawing of the one out in Troy, New York as, as their logo. But of all those 14 or that small group of 14 that exist, only one retains its original internal tank and its original structural and engineering integrity and that is ours. So beginning in the 1980s through all these efforts I've just described, our building began to become nationally prominent, nationally famous, really, at least among those people who are interested in industrial history. Um, in 1989, there was another article published in IA, and that was published by a woman um, named Mary Pine, who described this building, our building, as in a class by itself. It holds the last completely intact gas holder in a gas holder house in existence in the United States. The building is beautifully crafted, displaying 12 pilasters, narrow elongated, narrow elongated windows with semicircular window hoods, stone window sills, and a corbelled cornice. In other words, this building is technologically highly significant, but at the same time, it's beautiful. And it, it, it exemplifies the, the, the best of, of the technology and the design of its period. Um, ben mentioned that Samuel Holt provided the bricks for this building, 550,000 bricks that are in the walls of this building. 
Well, Samuel Holt was the most prominent brick manufacturer in Concord. And those bricks were made at what today we think of as the Grapponi Auto Junction. That was the Samuel Holt brickyard. So anyway, um, all of this was happening in the 19, uh, 80s and, and this this national significance was beginning to be more and more more um, obvious. Um, but in 2012, uh, the the Concord Heritage Commission began to take a a, a partnership role in all of this, um, it, and it received um, funding from the State Historic Preservation Office to employ a consultant, Lisa Mazoff to do um, a, an inventory form, which is the prelude to a national register listing for this building. And Lisa did that, and that's it has already has been quoted from extensively tonight uh, by Ben, especially. Um, it's an exemplary form, and it, it made it very clear that this building was um, and is a, a highly significant monument in American industrial history. Well, it took a number of years and took until 2017 for further money to be provided, and again by the State Preservation Office, the Division of Historical Resources, to the Concord Heritage Commission, and the, through them, the city of Concord, to actually employ a, a large consulting firm to do a really exemplary National Register nomination that summed up just about everything that we could hope to know about this building. And this was done in 2017, three years ago. And, and that is the document that provided much of what Ben told us about the building. And we the bridge that thing to about, Roger in a minute. I'm sorry. Can we bridge to Roger in a minute about the, the, the I'm just watching the clock about the yes. national. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just about done. I just want to say okay. the one thing about that nomination is that it was that it listed the building at the national level of significance. That's a highly unusual distinction here in New Hampshire. We only have two other properties listed at the national level. And one of them is the Castle in the Clouds in Moulton Borough. Um, and the other one is the Old Meadow Bridge in Shelburne, New Hampshire. And so uh, we have uh, the third in the, in the Concord Gas Holder, an unusual and important distinction. So I'll proceed, let, let the rest of you go ahead with all of this. But well, hopefully we'll have time to circle back. Thank you so much, Jim. I really yeah. appreciate that perspective. Roger, a little bit from your DC National Park Service perspective before we open it up. You're still muted. It happens. There we go. Okay. <laughs> but Thanks so much. I, I, I don't have a whole lot to add to, to Jim's summation and as well as those of the others. I, I have no specialty in, in industrial archaeology, but as a historian for the National Register program, I currently happen to be, one of my duties is to review National Register nominations for New Hampshire. Oh, this, uh, I didn't review this nomination. Um, but I'm also a historian, I, I work for the National Historic Landmark program. Less well known, I think, by the general public, but uh, as the name implies, it, it is it's similar to the National Register in many respects, except that National Historic Landmark uh, properties uh, are designated by the Secretary of Interior on the advice of the uh, um, National Parks Advisory Board. So it's a it's a different level of significance. So, it, um, and while I, I certainly can't declare anything National Historic and Landmark eligible, I can say from my experience working in, in Washington since, since 2008, that this would be a good candidate. And, and I hasten to add that this is not a, a solution to the problems of saving this building. National Historic Landmarks, when they're designated, they're only designated with, with owner consent and they have no restrictions on it, just like the National Register. So uh, it, it, it's not a, a, a tool to necessarily save a property if, if a property is designated as a National Historic Landmark. But I think it is important because it does have a, a another level of recognition. If 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 the board and the Secretary of Interior agreed that this property was nationally significant, and again, this is gets somewhat confusing, which I will not go into. With as Jim mentioned, it's the National Register has noted it being national significance, but that's um, of course a different designating uh, unit, and, and um, it's it's not quite the same. National Historic Landmarks are much fewer in number, and, and by nature of that, they're 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 uh, 
usually considered very special properties. And then the only thing I'll add to that is that to the extent that people know of National Historic Landmarks, they probably think of houses that George Washington lived in or Frank Lloyd Wright designed, which is certainly true, but an important aspect of the National Historic Landmark Program is and designation is vernacular architecture. That is vernacular buildings that once were very common and were very important in the history and the development of this country, but which are now few in number. And that is one of the reasons why, why the, the Concord building certainly attracts my attention. There are only, of the, of the number that, that Jim mentioned, only three are actually now listed in the National Register. This one, of course, and one in Oberlin, Ohio, in North Attleboro, Mass Massachusetts. And as Jim suggested, neither of those has uh, uh, the integrity, quite the integrity of the Concord building. So I, I can only say that, that, that I would encourage you all, and I'm impressed by this turnout, to, um, to continue to pursue whatever means you can to preserve the building. And in the case of, if you did pursue and write a, a, an inquiry to the, for the National Historic Landmark, that again would add, I would think, more um, publicity and, and more support and more recognition, which is what we have to do to save buildings. I mean, there is no, um, there's no easy way to save these buildings as you all well know, but we need to mobilize as many people as we can uh, to support important historic structures, which in, in my opinion, this is certainly one. Thank you so much, Roger. It's really great of you to take the time and be with us and uh, offer that perspective, working with hundreds and thousands of properties across the country and giving us that um, perspective and call to action. I really appreciate that. Um, so, and thank you to all the panelists. I, I would love people to use the chat to ask questions, the chat function to ask questions um, of the panelists, or maybe just to weigh in on their importance. Um, and I, I'm gonna say again that um, we are gonna do this second session on redevelopment options and we'll get more into what Liberty Utilities is looking for, um, city interests, private development interests, what feels like a match for the significance of this building and the needs and opportunities in that part of the city. Um, that's the no November um, 5th session and we'll send out an email to everybody who is on this session. And if you haven't already signed up, it's really easy to sign up. If you can't make that program, we still are gonna build some opportunities into the weeks ahead um, to share uh, early ideas with you about redevelopment options, as well as some more final, uh, more fully fleshed options after we have the public input, after our consultant Stu Arnett and his team get a chance to work on some different ideas. Um, so that's my advertisement about uh, part two of this, which will be an event, but more than an event. Um, there's, there's been some nice ideas that are here in the chat right now and that have come in from folks that weren't able to attend the meeting tonight, just about creative ways to document um, the building, to share what's cool about it inside, um, whether the building stays or if, if, if the building would have to go. So, um, well, love that idea from Robert that probably a lot of you are reading in the chat using drone footage or other video footage. Um, to build on what we already have. Um, what other kinds of questions? There's a lot of questions about the technical piece. I think what you've heard in this session is the internal workings are so important. So one of the guiding principles that this committee is using um, is to try to keep as much of the interior workings as possible intact if there's a redevelopment scenario that can, that can come forward as we look at different kinds of economically viable models, we're, we're looking at the importance of those internal workings. So adding things that can be reversed while keeping the essential working pieces, I think is a, um, a top priority, knowing what we know and what we've shared about the building tonight. Um, stable Stability right now, um, Liberty Utilities, this has been a, a challenge for them ever since they took ownership. 
Um, they're keeping the, trying to keep the property secure. Um, I'm not gonna speak for them. They're at the table to kind of look at some redevelopment scenarios, but um, um, they, I, as I said earlier in the program, I think they'd rather see a winning proposal here than demolition. We do, there has been a, a structural analysis of the building, Liberty Utilities and the city uh, paid for a study earlier this year there's actually a second look at it with a historic um, building engineer specialist that's going on over the next couple of weeks to kind of offer a second opinion or a deeper dive about its stability and about how some of these um, reuses that the committee and the consultants and the wider public us will be um, studying. Um, what about the National Park Service, a site similar to the mills in Lowell? Roger, I don't know if you want to take that one. <laughs> How's the question phrased? Uh, just curious about public uh, National Park Service involvement, a site similar to the mills in Lowell, for example. <laughs> I, yeah, I, again, that would be way beyond my pay grade, but, but it, such things are not inconceivable. But but obviously, they they uh, you know it's a question I, I can't answer. But all that I can say is again that the National Park Service in general as well as the National Register, National Historical Animal Programs, is interested in the history of this country and how it developed and important fact, important elements of, of the development of this country. Good. Um, anybody else see, a, um, any of the panelists see us, anything they want to respond to? Um, I think Liberty Utilities is willing to work with a a uh, potential buyer, uh, that was a question from Kate. Um, thank you for saying it's a great overview. Again, thank you to our panelists. Um, There's a question about uh, friend fundraising and I think the redevelopment scenarios are gonna look at all of the mixes, right? What, what, can, um, what can happen in the private sector? Where are there sources of extra dollars? Like we have this great grant program in the state, LCHIP is the acronym. Um, uh, and you know what role might private fundraising play in something like that? Um, the city sit the table for this committee to see what role they would potentially play, um, depending on how things unfold. Um, certainly, as they've talked to developers in earlier iterations, when there was some interest in redevelopment, um, they've brought out that toolbox of different kinds of um, incentives and and dollars potentially that the public sector could offer, but nothing's just, I think everything's on the table. Uh, the guiding principles are all about, um, you know, finding a, 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 can we find a winning solution for that part of town that really fits the community, uh, does well by the building, uh, has um, sort of short and long-term um, positive benefits for city residents and city taxpayers. Um, how badly contaminated is the building and surrounding ground? I don't, I don't, Jim doesn't have the, or Ben don't have the official technical answer, but you wanna just talk about the role of the, the gas holder in that site right now in terms of the, <laughs> do, or I can take it if you don't wanna talk about it. Was that, was that for me, Jim Garvin, or was that for somebody else? Jim, if you do, do you have an opinion, a, a little bit to offer on that? I'm not setting you up as the expert. In the okay, community. all right. Well, I'm not, but I'll, <laughs> I'll say it anyway. Um, I, Liberty Utilities has already cleaned up that site as much as they could. Uh, and, and th but that doesn't mean there are not still contaminants on the site. Some of the contaminants are directly underneath the existing building. As long as that building stands with a slate roof, and as long as the roof doesn't leak too badly, then those contaminants directly under the building, which have been cleaned up to some extent, as much as they can be. But as, as, as long as the building stands, it, that forms a sort of a cap over whatever may remain underneath that building. And so um, I think that Liberty Utilities might actually prefer to find a scenario that would allow the building to remain. Because as I understand it, Liberty Utilities will always be responsible for cleanup on that site. In other words, if there is additional pollution that's identified or additional, additional hazardous materials identified on that site, they will, have, they will have the obligation as the current owners to clean that up. So anything we can do collectively with a re redevelopment reuse project that will prevent that building from being removed and thereby in a sense shield whatever may lie beneath it 
the uh, better it will be for Liberty Utilities and the better it will be for sure for the for the field of historic preservation and adaptive reuse in, in, New, in the United States. Thank you for that. Um, and more, more tune in for more, I guess. We'll try to see what else uh, comes across as part of this planning regarding the environmental issues. Um, an attendee thinks I dodged the question about stability, and maybe I did. I didn't mean to. Jim, do you have any any well, comments about that? Again, I'm not setting you up as the expert on this, but well, I'm I'm not on that either. The, the expert on this will be whoever may have the opportunity to get into the building, as you mentioned, and really study it from the standpoint of an understanding of 19th century technology. But as we all know, but we didn't mention it tonight, the the, the hole in the roof in that building caused by a falling tree left that roof portion of that roof open for about two years. A great deal of rainwater was, was, was funneled into the building. Um, and there, there was some structural damage. There was structural damage through the impact of the tree to the brick wall in that location, although we don't know how extensive that was. There also is deterioration of a, a wooden ring that runs around the top of that brick wall and that resists the outward spreading thrust or tendency of the rafters in the building. You saw that magnificent roof system. Well, it's all pressing out um, and wanting to, to move to flatten down. So this wooden ring resists that. And that ring has been damaged through, probably partly through impact, but partly through decay because of the water that entered the building. We all know about the crooked cupola on the top of that building. That The rumor was, of course, that that was tipped in the hurricane of 1938. Whether it's getting worse now or not, I don't know. But every time I drive by, I think it might be. And so I'm a little worried. There's another wooden ring up at the top of that roof. And that, may, that, uh, that according to some estimates, has also suffered some kind of damage. So we do have structural issues, but nobody has really assessed them or certainly put a a, a budget figure on how to correct those things. And they should be ideally corrected according to the technology of the building, 19th century technology. That's a wooden roof with a slate covering, uh, brick walls laid in, in made locally and, 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 and laid uh, in lime mortar, which is a soft and a flexible mortar. Th those things should be taken into consideration um, and, and, uh, and done gently and considerately for the, for the integrity of that building. That's good. That's good. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, just to try to respond to some other folks and panelists, jump in if you um, or anybody else if you have additions to this. Um, there, there is a very short time frame. Mark Davis said basically you have two months to save it for demolition. Um, we do have that hanging over the process, although as I've said numerous times, Liberty Utilities is certainly at the table. Um, I wanted to reinforce Roger's point that the national register status in and of itself doesn't protect it. We have demolition delay in Concord, so there'd be a process that the owner would have to go through, but ultimately nothing to stop it in terms of an ordinance or a specific regulation or anything like that. Um, I think there are private developers on the table. Um, the, the, the royal we here, I think, is looking at many different kinds of adaptive uses that could potentially um, keep the building intact or mostly intact. And we haven't talked about it yet this evening, looking at the whole two plus acre site, not just the round brick building. Um, and I, I, I don't think, uh, I would say, I, Jennifer, don't think somebody's going to show up with a check and have it all tied up by December. 31st, but I'm hoping there's enough there there in the process and certainly your interest and in taking time out of your schedules to be here and the great comments we've gotten tonight and I've gotten surrounding this program before, during and after certainly help fuel that process to hopefully get to enough there there by the end of the year. I don't know. Did that make sense? <laughs> yes. Um, So um, um, I hope I answered most of the questions. We have, um, as, we, as we recorded this program, we do record the whole chat. If we really miss somebody, um, the Preservation Alliance will try to follow up with you specifically. Um, I do wanna make the point again that, that we're interested in input, not just in these two programs, but outside of these programs too, and we've been um, getting people have been sending photographs that are amazing, ideas for reuse, um, uh, 
uh, and great lines, like the woman who um, called this the, um, you know, she, she was talking about the the view from the highway and saying, you know, this this feels like as this is important as the dome on top of the Capitol. This is part of the skyline. This is part of Concord and New Hampshire's identity. Um, so we close just with a um, a little outline of next steps. I think um, Councillor Champlin, do you want me to try to? I feel like I've said part of it, but I can try to describe it a little bit more. And a couple people have asked about some concepts. In in uh, we were expecting that at the November fifth meeting we'd be offering some preliminary concepts to get your advice about during the meeting and then use that input to add some meat to the bones going forward. Um, there have been a couple of suggestions that if we could provide anything in, in advance, that would be helpful. And I certainly appreciate that comment and we can try. I don't know if I can promise that. Yeah, I, I'll just jump in, Jennifer, and say that um, the uh, committee uh, that Jennifer described at the very top of this session, uh, which I'm chairing, uh, which was created by Mayor Boulay, uh, the intent is to oversee a process uh, in which we're partnering with the Preservation Alliance and uh, the city and the Preservation Alliance have pooled resources to retain a consultant uh, to uh, pull together a lot of the information uh, about uh, the gas holder, about past efforts to reuse it, about similar projects, uh, the challenges and the successes that they've faced, and to come back uh, to city council uh, with uh, possible avenues uh, to move forward to preserve and or reuse uh, the gas holder building. Um, and we're very um, uh, appreciative that Liberty Utilities is very open to a pathway that could uh, lead to the preservation of the gas holder. They, of course, as the property owners, are also concerned about safety issues and its stability and, and so on and so forth. So um, that is kind of what you're going to be hearing on November 5th when uh, our consultant, Stu Arnett, uh, comes back uh, with uh, uh, and presents uh, to the public uh, for public input, uh, whatever uh, options uh, they have developed, what other avenues they have uh, identified as possible paths forward. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you, Byron. Thank you for chairing the committee and that summary. Um, I think I'll, I'll close then. We're a little over 6.30. I wanted to thank our wonderful panel of presenters um, who we're not gonna let go of after this, um, after this session today. Um, Liz and Ben are both part of the committee and will continue to be involved and we'll, we'll look to our uh, Jim and Roger and other advisors uh, as well. Um, and I would just say, um, I'm uh, so grateful for this turnout tonight. I really appreciate um, folks wanting to engage in this topic. Um, it's, a, it's a big challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity and um, really appreciate um, your engagement related to this uh, challenging but wonderful topic. So you're here for the gas holder building and thank you all for participating. And we'll send a, a follow-up email with some um, summary and more information in it as well. So good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.